Michelle Flournoy is the former Under Secretary of Defense for Policy in the United States and the most senior female civilian to serve in the Pentagon. At the, at the top of uh, democratic lists of women who have a solid chance of becoming the nation's first female Secretary of Defense. I don't know if I broke a secret on that. Uh. <laughs> Confirmed as Under Secretary of Defense in February 2009, she served as the Pentagon's top policy advisor to former Defense Chief Robert Gates and for the last six months to Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta. Before being Under Secretary, uh, before becoming Under Secretary of Def Defense, uh, she worked in the Defense Department under President Clinton, holding two positions simultaneously. She was both the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy and Threat Reduction and the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy. In those capacities, she oversaw three policy offices in the Office of the United States Secretary of Defense. Flournoy was awarded the Secretary of Defense Medal for Outstanding Public Service in 1996, the Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Public Service in 1998, 2011 and 2012, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff's Joint Distinguished Civilian Service Award in 2000 and again in 2012. Before that, uh, Flournoy was a Distinguished Research Professor at the Institute, I'm sorry, in 2007, Michelle Flournoy founded and was named President of the Center for a New American Security, or CNAS, an independent nonpartisan national security think tank. Prior to co-founding this uh, organization, she was a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, in Washington, where she worked on a broad range of defense policy and international security issues. Before that, uh, Michelle Flournoy was a distinguished research professor at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University, where she founded and led the university's Quadrennial Defense Review Working Group. She holds a bachelor's in social studies from Harvard, a master's in international relations from Oxford, and uh, she and her husband, Scott Gould, who is Dep Dep Deputy Secretary for Veterans Affairs in the Veterans Administration, are the devoted parents of three children. Michelle Flournoy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the uh, kind introduction, and thank you, sir, for honoring me with your presence here, and thank you all for coming tonight. I have never had a chance to visit BYU before, but I've heard so many wonderful things about it. It's just an honor and a great pleasure to finally get a chance to, to be here. Uh, even though I left my last job in the Pentagon with the hope of traveling a little less, since I do have three kids, which are the most important part of that, that uh, bio, um, I found myself uh, traveling a little over a week ago down to Florida for the, pre the uh, presidential debate on foreign policy. I'm sure many of you watched it on television. After the debate was done, my job was to go out and be available for the press to answer questions and, and comment on what had taken place. And I found myself, because of my former position, uh, being sort of like the honey for the bees coming from the foreign press. So I found myself not only, first of all, explaining our process to a lot of journalists from other countries, but also and trying to answer their questions. And what really struck me about these journalists from other countries was their questions were very fundamental. What was the U.S. role in the world going to be in the future? What will our policy towards Asia be under these, if two candidates. What about the Middle East and the turmoil there? Will there be a conflict with Iran? These were the questions that they were asking. They are also the very questions that uh, our next president, who, whether it's President Obama or Governor Romney, will uh, have on their desks when they walk in the door. And it's some of the, they touch on some of the issues I want to discuss with you tonight. When the next president is sworn in, uh, he will be sworn in at a very co consequential and challenging moment in our history. He will face a daunting trio of challenges that will profoundly affect our national security.
The first challenge is the international environment itself. It's extremely complex, dynamic, volatile. Uh, we are coming out of more than a decade of war uh, in Iraq and now Afghanistan with a transition plan in place for 2014 on the horizon. We are seeing fundamental shifts in the balance of power in Asia with the rise of China and India and how all of the, the knock-on effects that that's having in the region. We see persistent threats like the threat of terrorism from Al-Qaeda as it morphs into uh, a set of regional affiliates in around the globe. We see dangers of continued nuclear proliferation, most urgent of which is Iran's quest for a nuclear weapon, uh, and the potential that that could spark further rounds of proliferation in the Middle East. We see both promise and, frankly, peril associated with the revolutions that have been sweeping across the Arab world. And we see technological change, uh, state power change that's leading to increasingly congested and contested global commons. So the maritime, air, uh, space, cyberspace domains are becoming more contested areas where that will pose new challenges for U.S. freedom of, of maneuver and freedom of action. And I could go on and on. I could spend the whole lecture just going through that list. So a very daunting set of international challenges. The second part of the trio is that the next president will have to address these challenges in an era of budgetary austerity. We have um, come through a period where we narrowly avoided um, another Great Depression. We've been through the worst global financial crisis since the Great Depression. We have seen uh, under both Republican and Democratic administrations more than a decade of deficit spending, and we've seen mounting national debt. We as a nation know that we have to get our uh, economic house in order. This has become a national security issue as well as a domestic issue. And that's going to involve some very hard choices about where to set priorities and where to accept and manage risk, particularly when you're dealing with that myriad of international challenges I just went through. The third part of the trio of challenges that for the next president is that he must address all of this in an era of unprecedented political polarization. Polarization that has essentially brought governance in this country to a virtual standstill. The poster child of this paralysis was the Super Committee's failure to reach a deal uh, on reducing our national debt. Given the stakes involved for our country, this failure uh, to reach a pragmatic compromise really, I think, casts harsh light on a different kind of deficit. And, and that's uh, the deficit of political courage and vision and classic American pragma pragmatism, the kind of pragmatism that has always been uh, what makes our democracy work. These, are sorely, these qualities are sorely needed as, uh, at a time when ideological discipline is too often trumped other nobler forms of discipline that have you know, made this country great in our history. Beyond the negative impacts here at home, this situation has actually generated what, what I would say is a very pernicious, pernicious narrative abroad, and that is the narrative of U.S. decline. When you go abroad to places like China uh, and uh, the Middle East, people ask you whether the, the U.S. will be a re reliable ally in the future, whether we have the staying power to deal effectively with emerging challenges, to sustain our unique and indispensable leadership role in the world. I strongly disagree with the, the basis of this narrative. Far from being a nation in decline, I believe that America's standing in the world remains strong and our ability to lead the international community is unmatched. Even as other powers rise and the distribution of power becomes more diffuse, the U.S. remains the indispensable power in the international system. No other nation compares to our power and influence, whether you're talking militarily, economically, or in terms of soft power. The American economy is still by far the largest, the most developed and dynamic, dynamic in the world. With a sustained positive growth rate over the last 60 years, it represents nearly a quarter of global GDP, 
compared with less than 10% for China, approximately 15 or 18% for the nations of the Eurozone combined. Our military is still the largest and mo most capable in the world. It is battle-tested and it has been proven to be able to adapt and innovate to meet a very complex and broad array of, of challenges. Our potent and very influential network of alliances and partnerships around the world is unique and it ensures that we very rarely have to act alone. And our soft power is reflected in our influence, the influences of our values, our influence on the cultural landscape, our influence in international institutions, both public and private. It reflects the sustained appeal of America's ideals of freedom, human rights, uh, and democracy. To, so to paraphrase Mark Twain, the reports of America's demise are greatly exaggerated. But that's not to say that sustaining our unique leadership position will, uh, will be a given. It's not. It will require tough choices to revitalize the foundation of our national security, our economy, including bringing government spending and revenues into line, into balance, controlling health care and entitlement costs, and increasing long-term investment in what is, are the drivers of our economic competitiveness, things like education, infrastructure, innovation. Sustaining our leadership position in the world will also require smart engagement abroad to ensure the very conditions on which our economic recovery and growth rely, things like stability in key regions and uninterrupted trade flows. In sum, we are, as President Obama has said, at a strategic inflection point, a time when we have to begin to shift our gaze from the recent past, the demands of the last decade of war, to focus on how are we going to shape the next 10 years, the next 20 years, the next 30 years, and how are we going to secure the drivers of our, uh, ec our economic prosperity and our security long term. So it's in this context that the next president, whoever it is, will have to give priority to five key challenges to advance our national security. The first, you can guess from what I've already said, in my view, is breaking the domestic political gridlock, getting to a budget deal that unleashes our economic growth, setting the parameters of our tax policy, our government spending, freeing up private sector investment, that's what's going to unleash the economy and create jobs. If we believe that uh, economics, uh, our economic strength is the foundation of our national security, and I do believe that's the case, um, then uh, this is a national security imperative as much as a domestic one. Uh, it's also critical to putting a stop to this very pernicious narrative, uh, an erroneous narrative of U.S. decline. You know, the Australian Prime Minister recently said something that I really liked. She said, the United States is just one budget deal away from restoring its global preeminence, and I would agree. The second cha uh, challenge that the next president will face uh, in terms of urgency is preventing Iran's acquisition of a nuclear weapon. Uh, president Obama has been clear that he's committed to preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon and that all options are on the table. Governor Romney has been very clear that he endorses this goal. So many people have asked, well, why prevention and not containment? Containment served us well all those years in the Cold War. My answer is that because even if some element of nuclear deterrence could be established with Iran, the broader negative effects of a nuclear Iran could not be adequately contained. There is the potential, first and foremost, for others in the region to feel compelled to also pursue a nuclear weapons option in response, creating a cascade of proliferation in the most volatile region of the world. There's also the potential that, potential that Iran's proxies, like Hezbollah, that they would feel more emboldened to undertake destabilizing activities across the region, to undertake terrorism um, covered by Iran's nuclear umbrella. So what's the right strategy for stopping stopping Iran's acquisition of a nuclear weapon. I think it is many of the steps that we are pursuing and, and need to continue to pursue. First, putting together an international com uh, coalition that has put in place the most crippling sanctions in the history. 
sanctions that have devalued Iran's currency by 80 percent and have virtually stopped its uh, oil exports. Uh, second, keeping all options on the table, including military options, uh, and making sure that we take the necessary steps to make those real. That means planning, it means exercising, it means posturing our forces in the region, and that has been done. And we need to make it clear to Iran that the door to negotiations is not open forever. Third, we need to try to seek to change Iran's calculus and negotiate an outcome uh, using diplomacy that brings Iran back into, its uh, com uh, back into compliance with its nonproliferation obligations under the nonproliferation treaty. And meanwhile, we have to try uh, do our best to continue to reassure our ally Israel that the U.S. has an unshakable commitment to its security. Uh, that despite whatever we hear in the rhetoric of our elections, that commitment has been by fully bipartisan and shared across numerous administrations since Israel's founding. Uh, it's, been, it's been supported of late by historic levels of security assistance, by U.S. investment in Israel's rocket and missile defenses, uh, and by the largest bilateral defense exercise ever in our history. Should, uh, this should be true no matter who is elected president. As I said, this has been a bipartisan plank of our, of our foreign policy for, for decades. In my view, it's ultimately far better to resolve the situation using uh, diplomacy without the resort to force, if at all possible. Striking an Ira Iranian nuclear facilities would, in the end, only be a delay. It's a, it's a move that someone, one of my colleagues called it's mowing the grass. <laughs> but um, the day after that happens, you have to be in a position to have international unity to try to continue to prevent uh, Iran's pursuit. So the only ultimate resolution is to get them to actually agree to some constraints. The third challenge on the next president's plate is ending the war in Afghanistan responsibly while continuing to sustain uh, our focus on al-Qaeda. Uh, this administration has refocused U.S. policy on a very clear set of objectives, disrupting, dismantling, defeating al-Qaeda, and denying its safe haven wherever it takes root. Um, this is our strategic objective in Afghanistan. It is a limited objective, but it is a strategic one. We are now on the path uh, to transition with uh, the Afghans stepping into the lead for security across the country by 2014. That timeline has the full support of the Afghans. It has the full support of 49 uh, ISAF partners who are there with us on the ground. Uh, we will bring the bulk of our troops home at that point, but it will not end our commitment. We will not walk away from Afghanistan. We have seen that movie before. A small residual force will stay in place to do joint counterterrorism operations with the Afghans and to also continue to train and support them as they develop as a military. Plus, there's a larger strategic partnership agreement that's put in, been put in place to ensure continued cooperation and economic development assistance. Here's the challenge, though. Uh, we have put a huge amount of effort into creating a security, a, a better security situation in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, uh, the various elements uh, of Afghan leadership and society have not used that time and space as effectively as they might have to make political progress, to get towards real reconciliation between the different factions on the ground. Um, I still think there's time for that to make progress, but if it doesn't change, it will increase the level of risk associated with for sustaining our gains uh, after 2014. The good news, and having made eight trips to Afghanistan in my three years as undersecretary and gone to virtually every province, the good news is that the, the real progress in Afghanistan from the bottom up in terms of local governance and local development is real, and that is sustainable um, in many parts of the countries. The ANSF progress, the Afghan National Security Forces progress, even though you hear of some very tragic and disturbing violence against between some of uh, the Afghans and tra their trainers, 
that uh, they, the NSF is now in the lead for more than half of the country, securing half the country, and where they are in the lead for the most part, it's going, they're doing so quite successfully. So there is some good news there. But what we, for our part, as the United States, we need to stay focused on our strategic objective of denying Afghanistan as a future safe haven for terrorists. Beyond Afghanistan, we need to evolve our counterterrorism strategy as al-Qaeda evolves as an organization. Certainly, we need to keep pressure on the core of al-Qaeda, which is in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region, and we've made tremendous progress in decimating their leadership ranks there. Uh, but we also need to put greater emphasis on building the capacity of our partners in countries like Yemen so that they can secure their own territory and reduce the terrorist threat to us. We also need to continue partnered counterterrorism operations wherever possible with a host nation in the lead. But um, there will certainly be, almost certainly, be times in the future where unilateral U.S. operations against imminent threats are necessary when our partners are either unable or unwilling uh, to take care of the threat for us. I did want to pause for a moment and share an anecdote that makes some of this uh, real. I had the opportunity to witness this president work through the decision of whether or not to launch the raid against Osama bin Laden. While it may, in retrospect, seem like that was a no-brainer no presidential decision, it was not at all clear at the time. At the time, all of the intelligence we had was purely circumstantial. The presence of a former al-Qaeda facilitator at the compound, unusual security measures uh, uh, and unusual architecture in the compound, but there was no direct hard evidence that bin Laden was actually there. When it came time to advise the president um, with recommendations, his advisors were divided. Uh, some said you should wait, uh, take more time, gather more intelligence, be more certain. Others said you should do this spot from the air, conduct an airstrike, but don't put Americans on the ground in harm's way. Others said we have these wonderful new te technologies, these stealthy drones, you should use those to go uh, take out the compound. And finally, you had others who said, this is what special operations were created for. Uh, the only way we're going to absolutely know it's him and have the evidence to show that is through using special operations. All of this involves serious risks. There is the risk associated with putting U.S. lives in harm's way, the risks of the, the potential strains it would create in our relationship with Pakistan, and the risk of what if we were wrong? What would that do? to U.S. credibility uh, and standing in that part of the world and more broadly. So my point is, if you, if you take this as a case of presidential decision making, we know that the next president, whoever he is, will have to make similar tough calls of one kind or another, calls that will require leadership, judgment, fortitude, and a very strong moral compass. One last impression that I would just share from that night about the most memorable moment uh, when the raid actually occurred. Some might think it was when the helicopter went down. Some might think it was when, you know, Geronimo KIA, the, the bin Laden code name, came over the radio. For me, it was walking out of the White House Situation Room at midnight and hearing singing and sort of list, stopping and listening and realizing that hundreds and hundreds of Americans had gathered spontaneously on the, lawn, the park across from the White House, and they were singing the national anthem and realizing that this was a great a moment of national closure after 9-11, and that was the real importance of, of this event. <clears throat> the fourth challenge that the next president will have to deal with is protecting our uh, interests uh, in the Middle East in this period of revolutionary change. As you all know, uh, students of international relations, the U.S. has many vital interests in this region, from uh, ensuring the free, fl free flow of oil to international markets to ensuring our own access to critical 
trade routes uh, uh, and international waterways like the Strait of Hormuz, the Suez Canal. We also have an, a deep interest in this region becoming more democratic and free. The only path to stability, in my view, is through further political and economic reform. I think the U.S. chose to be on the right side of history when we chose to support these revolutions. In Libya, we led an international coalition that included not only our traditional European partners but the Arab League to prevent civilian massacre of tens of thousands of Libyans by their own government and create the conditions for the Libyan opposition to pull together and actually overthrow a, a brutal dictator. In Egypt, we called for Mubarak to step down. We worked behind the scenes to press the Egyptian military not to make the revolution violent, not to oppose those in Tahrir Square, the demonstrators, and to ensure a peaceful handover of power. In Syria, uh, we have been very clear as the United States that Assad must go. We have been providing humanitarian assistance, non-lethal assistance, command and control uh, to the, uh, the opposition on the ground, assistance to the parts of Syria that are now free and out of, from under Assad's control, working uh, intensively behind the scenes to try to unify the opposition so that they can become a viable alternative, uh, so that they can articulate a platform for transition going forward that would guarantee minority rights and allow the Alawites to abandon Assad and switch sides. That was, it is what will tip this, this situation in Syria. But as these revolutions unfold, we have to be very careful that as we support the democratic process, it doesn't bring non-democratic elements into, into power. In Libya and Egypt, for example, we have to continue to work to shape the decisions of new leaders there, help them understand that U.S. assistance, international assistance, depends on their willingness to abide by their international obligations, such as the Egyptians' commitment to the peace accords with Israel, and to international norms, such as protection for the, their own minority populations. We, but we must expect that there are going to be very significant ups and downs as these historic events unfold. These revolutions will unfold over the course of a generation or more. This is a very long book. Think, you know, War and Peace. And we are in the very early pages of the, early, of the first chapter. And frankly, the pen is in the hands of the populations uh, in these countries. The fifth and final challenge I'll highlight for you for the next president is rebalancing more of our attention and resources towards Asia Pacific. Now, some of you have heard of this notion of the pivot. I don't use the word pivot because pivot sounds like you're turning your back on other parts of the world, which we, is not the intention. But as you think about our long-term future, no region in the world will be more important to U.S. economic prosperity and growth than Asia Pacific. It accounts for half the world's population and GDP, nearly half of global trade. Plus, given the shifting uh, power dynamics we talked about earlier with China and, and Indian on the rise, these dynamics will greatly affect our interests. Since World War II, the United States has placed a very unique stabilizing role in this region. And that stability that's been created is what has allowed for tremendous economic growth in the region uh, and tremendous growth in global, com global commerce and our own prosperity. As I said, rebalancing does not mean turning our back on the Middle East or walking away from our NATO allies. What it does mean uh, is putting relatively more emphasis on Asia, diplomatically. First of all, you've got to show up. You actually have to go to the various regional meetings and be a consistent presence and play a leadership role. You have to invest in modernizing your traditional alliances with countries like Japan and, and South Korea and Australia. And you also have to invest in new and critical partnerships like uh, India and the countries of Southeast Asia. And you have to try to play your part to lead in certain multilateral fora to reinforce the rules-based order uh, that will ultimately reduce the risk of conflict with uh, these shifting power dynamics. 
Economically, it means bolstering our bilateral investment and trade with these countries. It means pursuing free trade agreements like the TPP. Militarily, it means adjusting our posture so that a little bit more of our naval and air forces are uh, rotating through the region, providing more presence, more access, more training and exercising with our partners in the region, while also ensure that, ensuring that we protect investment in the very capabilities that will ensure our freedom of action in an increasingly congested and contested global commons. So I'd like to conclude my prepared remarks with a note of optimism, because any of, any of you who know me uh, know that I am uh, unfailingly optimistic. <laughs> um, one of the reasons why I believe that we will see, ultimately, a sustained period of American leadership is that when, in our history, throughout our history, when we have encountered times of difficulty, times of challenge as a nature, as a nation. We as a people come together. We come together to pursue our broader national interests. I very recently experienced a coming together of this nature, nature that no one thought was possible. When the Congress passed the Budget Control Act of 2011 by a bipartisan majority, they told the Pentagon to find $487 billion of cuts over 10 years, almost half a trillion dollars. Now normally, when that kind of uh, direction comes from the Congress, uh, you, it's like pour, pouring lighter fluid on a, the fire of inter-service rivalry. You know, the gloves come off, the knives come out, people are protecting their share of the pie. What was extraordinary this last time around was that that didn't happen. The president invited the secretary, the chairman, all of the service chiefs, all of the combatant commanders to first one, then two, then three multiple hour sessions at the White House. And he basically said, I want all of you to come first as Americans and second as part of a, a corporate body that is responsible for the defense of this nation. And this is what our Congress has told us we have to live within. And how are we going to keep this country safe? Can we keep this country safe? How do we do that? So take off your parochial hat, put on your national security corporate board of directors hat, and let's work through this together. And they worked iteratively for many hours and came up with a strategy that is now the strategic guidance of the United States. And it is the strategy that has driven the FY13 budget. The fact that that could happen in these circumstances gives me hope that it is possible that we can actually be our best selves in these times, these very ch challenging times. It was an example of the strategic and of, uh, of the national interest trumping the parochial. So the question I have is, can the Congress and the next administration rise to the occasion, given the polarization and the parochialism that has so dominated our recent political discourse. Protecting this nation's security in these consequential and challenging times will require all of us to look beyond our narrow interests of any particular office or department or party or state or region or service or special interest group. There are those who have, believe that we have lost the ability to do this. But the process that generated that strategic guidance gives me hope to think otherwise. And the truth is, we must transcend the partisan and the parochial to protect our national security for the future. So on that note, let me stop and say thank you and invite uh, some discussion. Thank you. Hi, Michelle. Hello. My name is Richard Galvan, and I'm a senior studying international relations. And um, I wanted to ask you about the silent war, which is the drone war going on in Afghanistan and Pakistan, which is rarely mentioned. Um, there was a recent Stanford NYU study that approximated that between 1,400 and 2,600 
um, people have died as a result of this drone war. And this was conducted over 130 different interviews, and they concluded that of these deaths, only 2% of the deaths were actually um, high-level targeted kills. And uh, many of these were civilian deaths. Um, they were children um, that have died. Um, and many communities in Pakistan um, have been disrupted because of the drone war. And um, uh, it's, to them, seen as a sign of uh, essentially a violation of their sovereignty. Um, the study also uh, cited the fact that recruitment numbers are now up and that the drone war is actually motivating violence. Um, so if we believe the president should have the power, um, including U.S. citizens, to be essentially executed and killed without due process, with no checks or transparency, and this was validated under the NDAA, which is the National Def Defense Authorization Act, which was signed by President Obama on New Year's Eve last year, and is actually being challenged in many courts of law. Um, where have we gone? So lots of questions in that one question. Um, yes. <laughs> let, me, let me try to um, work through this issue. Um, first of all, you know, I think that we have to have a comprehensive approach to fighting terrorism. Um, and our preferred approach is working in concert with partners and allies who take the lead on the ground, we support them with capacity building, we support them in being effective. Uh, where that's not possible, whether a where a government lacks the capability or lacks the, the political will to actually assert their will in a given area and deal with terrorists that pose an imminent threat to the United States, and that's a very key condition, uh, active plotting that we that poses an imminent threat to the United States homeland. There will be times when we need to take unilateral measures. Um, the one thing I can say about uh, I can't say a lot about the use of drones, but I can't. The one thing I can say is that um, there is an impression out there are a couple of misimpressions out there. One misimpression is that this is done without any regard to uh, law or to authority. And I can tell you that every single target is vetted with regard to the, authors, the authorities that have been, been provided by Congress uh, in the AUMF. The authors, you know, this is the uh, legislation that was passed after 9-11. Um, second thing is extraordinary care is taken to uh, prevent civilian casualties. I will tell you that there is very strong evidence of substantial uh, misreporting and disinformation in ter on the civilian casualty issue, particularly in Pakistan, where there is U.S. observation that validates that absolutely no civilians were killed, and the next day the press will have, you know, 200 people were killed and, you know, uh, so there's all, I think it's very difficult to adjudicate this using only open source material and there's a lot of misperceptions out there. Um, but I think the, the, the third point I would make is that I think there is a danger in over-reliance on any one instrument, particularly one that is unilateral and kinetic. Because you, you have to look at this in the long term and that is how, does, how do various approaches feed the cycle of radicalization, recruitment, uh, and, and also on the other end, you know, taking people off the battlefield. And so I think that we have to consider this as part of a, a, a broader strategy. But I would just tell you from personal experience, extraordinary care is taken, extraordinary, and at, at the highest levels, care is taken to be compliant with the law and avoid at, um, at, at very large cost civilian casualties. Thank you. Uh, first, I would just like to say thank you for coming and spending time with us tonight. Sure. Um, I uh, appreciated uh, having some conversations with an associate of yours, Dr. Noggle, uh, who's been a great source of, uh, of wisdom, I guess. Um, my question is, uh, as we've seen the map in the Middle East reset with the Arab Spring, uh, with fundamentally authoritarian, 
perhaps uh, strong regimes being replaced by uh, perhaps weaker regimes, um, perhaps even uh, governments that are more uh, complacent or uh, compromise their stance on uh, terrorist organizations, the Muslim Brotherhood being one in Egypt. Um, do you see, uh, within that kind of lens, uh, do you think the attack um, in Benghazi recently is an anomaly, uh, or is it um, more of an indication of kind of the expansion of terrorist activity and terrorist attacks uh, throughout uh, the Muslim world, um, and perhaps the proliferation of um, Al Qaeda or, or like minded groups outside of Afghanistan and Pakistan? It's a very good question. Um, uh, you know, the U.S. has been targeted for attacks of this nature for, you know, as long as we've been in the Middle East. Think of Marine Barracks in Lebanon, you know, the attack on our uh, Air Force facilities in Saudi Arabia, the Kobar Towers. It's just, this, so there's always this, this, there have long been these elements and there's always that vulnerability. I think what happened in Libya is, um, uh, is the result of the fact that you have the very early days of a new nation emerging. They, the, the government does not yet have a monopoly on the use of force. Um, so it has not managed yet to unify the different elements of uh, these different militias, these different groups, into a military and police force that's cohesive and that's government controlled. And I think in that um, vacuum, uh, despite a lot of effort on security assistance and by on the part of us and on the part of the Europeans and others who would have been involved in the intervention, um, they're still working down that road and in that vacuum there are some extremist groups that are uh, operating inside Libya. Um, I think in the case of Benghazi, um, the, uh, the, uh, the intelligence picture in terms of what we knew, when we know, knew it, uh, that's been evolving over time. And uh, I think initially there was some thought that perhaps there was a protest that was then hijacked by an attack. It now looks like this was an, just a direct attack, a terrorist attack, but not one for which there was any, to my knowledge, any advanced intelligence reporting. So this was rather um, uh, unpredicted. Um, I think that the fact that the, you know, the president launched an investigation and said you know, no interference whatsoever, we will get to the bottom of, this, bottom of this, if there are lessons learned, if there are people to be held accountable, if there were mistakes made, we're going to find out what those were and we're going to deal with it. And I think he's been very clear uh, to send a signal that, look, we're going to figure out who was responsible for this and uh, bring those uh, perpetrators to justice. Um, and I think his credibility on that point will be strong. But this is a, this is a um, example of a phenomenon that we're going to have to deal with throughout this region going, going forward. Um, and I think it's going to raise a lot of hard trade-offs about um, how we define our presence, how we secure our presence, how we operate in the region effectively. Uh, we obviously need to be on the ground, but there are also real risks for being on the ground. Thank you. Okay, that's Scott Lovebell. Um, in the second presidential debate, Mitt Romney spoke about making countries uh, like China play by the rules. Um, how do statements like this affect China and other Asian nations in the region? And how do we change pol policy of a country with an average growth rate of 10 percent and the largest population in the world? It's a great question. Actually, I think this issue of trying to integrate China into a rules-based order um, and have them be a responsible stakeholder is actually been a theme that well, across both Republican and Democratic administrations, and um, and I and it's something that U.S. diplomats are con diplomats are constantly saying to their Chinese counterparts. I think the 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 argument for that change being possible rests on the belief that China has an incentive to be part of the global economy because. 
the political elite in China, their, their ability to remain in power depends on continuing to grow their economy, continuing to lift millions and millions of people every year out of poverty. And the only way they can do that is to be fully integrated into that global economy. To the extent their behavior departs from international norms and, and isolates them in any way or uh, constrains them or makes them the object of sanctions or being labeled a currency manipulator or being you know, subject to trade wars, that hurts them. That's not in their interest. So there is some common interest in this. That said, they are a rising power with a very um, proud history and they expect to be able to influence that rules-based order to make it more to their liking. And that's the friction that we're going to have to manage in the coming years and try to do so without it resulting in any kind of con open conflict. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Cadet Robert Perez, thank you for being here. Uh, I kind of want to switch topics a little bit and talk about immigration. So could you address past illegal immigration laws and how those compare to current laws and how we can improve those laws? Uh, well, I'm going to give you the award for challenging me outside my uh, area of expertise. Um, what I will say is that I think, you know, immigration reform has become a strategic issue for this country. Um, the system that we've had in the past is not serving us adequately now. Uh, I think when you look at U.S. demographics, when you look at what drives growth in our economy, when you look at what drives innovation and so forth. It is, you know, it's our national strength when we figure out how to welcome, integrate, leverage, incorporate all of that wonderful element, uh, energy and talent from around the world. We have got to do a better job of this and I think this is a very ripe issue for the next president in the next four years, but I can't exactly answer your question without getting way out of my own depth. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Cadet Chris Riley, thank you for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you about Pakistan with trying to, what you mentioned about strengthening our alliance with India and also pulling out of Afghanistan. What does that mean as far as Pakistan, which is, holds nuclear weapons and is a kind of a vital, volatile country? Um, it's, it's a very important question. The stability of Pakistan will uh, really determine the stability of the South, whole South Asian region in the coming years. Pakistan has a number of challenges. It is, um, has a very weak set of civilian institutions, uh, a very strong set of security institutions, um, a, a growing arsenal of nuclear weapons, a population that is becoming increasingly uh, radicalized in terms of its religious views um, and whole swaths of its territory that are ungoverned and still uh, at risk of becoming havens for terrorists or still are havens for terrorists. Um, and so it is a, a bit of a tinderbox. Uh, and I think if you were to ask many of the uh, leaders of the current national s security team what keeps them up at night, it is scenarios involving um, Pakistan. Uh, we have made a strategic investment in that partnership. Um, it has had great ups and downs. I don't think we have a choice of walking away from the relationship when we've done that in the past with sanctions and so forth. It hasn't turned out so well. It hasn't served our interests very well. Um, so I think we have to work closely with them. In my view, in the long term, what will strengthen Pakistan's position more than anything else is stronger civilian government, stronger civilian institutions that actually can redirect the resources of the country towards meeting the basic needs of the population as opposed to sort of fueling uh, continued tension with, with, with India. Um, but that's a long-term uh, project. But we need to be on the right side of that effort, in my view. Other questions?
along with everybody else, thanks for being here. I'm Bryce Fisher. I'm also a cadet. Um, I have a question for you, returning back to Benghazi. Do you believe that the three requests on behalf of the U.S. Ambassador to beef up the security in Benghazi was a policy failure of President Obama's, or what, what's your take on that? You know, I don't, until we get, get all the way through the investigation, I, I haven't been briefed on the details of exactly what happened when, how far those requests went, you know, who at what level saw them. I, I don't know those details. Um, I, um, so I can't answer the specific. I am concerned that in general, one of the things that's happened as budget constraints have tightened is we've shortchanged diplomatic security in general. If you look at the State Department request for security and then what the Congress has given them in return, it tends to be tens of billions of dollars, of, or uh, I'm sorry, hun hundreds of millions of dollars short of what they actually need to be securing their facilities abroad. So, um, but I can't answer the specifics in this case because I don't think we know all of the facts yet. That's exactly what the investigation is going to get at. Thank you. Yep. I want to apologize for not properly introducing myself earlier. I'm Cadet Hiram Palmer, um, and I'll take the liberty of asking another question, if I may. Um, you earlier mentioned uh, Julia Gillard, who uh, the mm -hmm. Prime Minister of Australia, who recently called kind of the upcoming century an, an Asian century. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, there's a huge debate there about whether or not this um, upcoming century will be characterized more as an Asian or an American one. But in the context of our current commitments to the region, carriers, Air Force assets, et cetera. Um, do you see them being uh, enough to uh, continue the kind of regional stability you were pointing to um, in the in the Asia Pacific region over the m maybe past 60 years, um, or with kind of recent Chinese posturing and uh, saber rattling? Do you see the U.S. needing to seriously realign troops and um, strategic assets in the near future? Um, I think that um, we are in the process of shifting our posture more towards Asia. Um, Secretary of Defense Panetta has talked about putting 60 percent of the fleet um, into the Asia-Pacific region, with many of those actually rotations also transiting the Middle East, um, so it's a, a twofer. <laughs> but, um, you know, the budget calls to build the Navy to about 300 ships and then sustain it at that level for two th from 2019 forward. Um, it, uh, but more important than the number of ships, in my view, is what's being put on those ships and on the airplanes. And the thing, one of the things that came out of the strategic guidance review was a very firm commitment to prioritize and protect investment in the capabilities that underwrite this new concept of air-sea battle, which is ensuring that our Air Force and our naval <coughs> assets, both Navy and Marine, can actually operate it in a very contested environments, in environments where, you know, another military was trying to deny us access or deny us an area. Um, and so it's that investment in those critical capabilities that is really as important, if not more important in my mind, um, than simply counting, you know, platform numbers. Um, I think when you look at side-by-side -side comparisons uh, between the U.S. and the China, China um, there is no comparison, you know, Navy to Navy or Air Force to Air Force in terms of quantity or quality. Um, but that's not the point. The point is, um, to the extent China challenges the military balance in the region, they're going to do so asymmetrically. So the real question is, do we have what we need to meet an asymmetric challenge? Um, my hope is that, that you know, certainly we need to invest as a nation to have the capabilities necessary to maintain our freedom of action and stability in the region. My hope is that we, will ne we won't actually get to a point of direct uh, competition and conflict if we play our diplomatic and economic cards right. Um, but this is a very important question for the future shaping of the U.S. military. Um, but I think that some of the, the hyping of this issue that's happened during the election debate, I think when you actually look at the analysis, is overplayed. And uh, in a resource-constrained environment where you have to make choices, I think we've, we've, we've managed, you know, I think we have it about right in the current plan. Okay.